When a video game establishes itself a certain way, sometimes it goes on like that forever, and sometimes something new is introduced that changes the whole game. In a lot of cases, we're talking about new abilities. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 abilities that totally changed video game franchises. Starting off with number 10, it's smoke bombs in the Assassin's Creed series. Now the first Assassin's Creed game was crazy basic, even for the series. It lacked a lot of the more iconic abilities and tools that most people associate with the franchise, and that includes the now ubiquitous smoke bombs. Like you know what these things are, right? Right there in the name. You throw them, they explode, make a big smoke cloud, breaks line of sight, makes it easy to escape if you've been caught by guards. In Assassin's Creed 2, pretty much worked the same as in Arkham Asylum, where you can only throw one down at your feet, which made their usefulness a lot more limited in comparison to later games, but uh, starting with Brotherhood, the second game in the Assassin's Creed 2 trilogy, Ezio now, amazingly, can throw a bomb somewhere other than his feet. It may have taken him many years of assassination experience to figure out this brilliant trick, but better late than never, I guess. And here's where smoke bombs get good, like ridiculously good, overpowered even. From this point on where at any game that lets you throw smoke bombs it's super easy and the ones that don't are, are much harder and the games constantly switch between the two assassin's creed unity has some especially ridiculous smoke bombs you clear out entire enemy bases with just a few of them no stealth even required smoke bombs and by extension all the assassination tools completely changed the direction of the series for a more straightforward linear game with scripted assassinations to a much more open-ended player-driven experience <laughs> When the games really let the players go wild with the tools, they tend to be better, even if they can trivialize certain parts. And number nine is the character wheel with the Grand Theft Auto series. After GTA V, it's really hard to imagine the series without the character wheel. It's the defining feature of that game, and it feels like a little weird, honestly, going back to previous games that don't have it. It might be a little premature. Grand Theft Auto V is the only game in the series with a character wheel. But even if we don't know 100% for sure Rockstar is going to keep this feature in GTA VI, like, they're going to keep it. All the leaks and rumors point to some form of character switching in GTA 6, so I think it's safe to say that this ability will probably be refined and has probably redefined the franchise as well. Even though the game's 10 years old, the character switching still feels like ahead of its time, ahead of our time. Once all the characters are unlocked and you can switch between them whenever you want without even having to open up a menu or look at a loading screen, you just select your character while in the game, zooms out, pans over, zooms back into whoever you picked, and they're usually doing something. Outside of just looking awesome and being fast and satisfying, it's a technical marvel, and it takes all the usual tedium out of playing multiple characters in a game. Like, they got it right. How's those choppers doing? I'm bringing the chopper back around. Nah, man, get the bricks out of here. We'll go out on foot. Hey, get out of here, man. Get them bricks gone. You heard him go. Donkey Kong Country was great, but Donkey Kong 64 nearly wiped out character switching, I feel like. After Donkey Kong 64, there just wasn't much of it at all in any game. Uh, but GTA 5 made character swapping cool again. At number eight is weapon skills in the From Software games. I wanted to make this point about the Dark Souls series, but it wouldn't really be accurate. From Software tends to iterate on its formula, even when it's not part of the same quote unquote franchise. These games have different names, but starting with Demon's Souls, they're basically iterating and expanding on ideas introduced in the previous game. They don't reinvent the wheel with every new game. They're all building off one another and they are all in a way a series. So that's enough for me. Weapon skills are a perfect example of that though. Before Bloodborne, weapons basically had their normal and heavy attacks. That was pretty much it. There are a few unique moves here and there, but it wasn't a mechanical part of the game. In Bloodborne, they went all in, though, on weapon abilities with the switch weapon mechanic, where you could change a weapon's form with the press of a button, which would usually completely change the moveset, and in some cases would unlock powerful abilities that were completely unique to each weapon. That was some weapons, though. In Dark Souls 3, the game they made after Bloodborne, they applied this to every weapon. Now every weapon had some kind of baked in weapon art, some of which are pretty basic, but some of the boss weapons would get pretty flashy. Now Elden Ring is where those abilities really come into their own, 
it's one of the many reasons why this game feels like the culmination of everything that came before it. The real refined souls formula. Now mostly separate from weapons is Ashes of War that are attached to weapons that grant you powerful and often necessary abilities. And what makes them so great is that they swapped out and changed to adapt to whatever situation they're in. So in general, they're a lot more useful and I, like most people, ended up using them a lot more than weapon arts in Dark Souls 3. Some of them are uh, uh, li fairly limited in their utility, you know? These skills completely change how you play the game. They encourage a more aggressive play style and still reward strategic thinking and timing. Adds another layer of combat onto the thing, you know, other than like press dodge, wait for opening, press attack button. There's more to like souls as a whole, but yeah. And number seven is Glory Kills from Doom 2016. Doom was always a fast-paced, action-focused FPS series. Uh, well, other than Doom 3. Doom 3 is not that. But uh, pfft, even then, you're pretty quick. Not in comparison to any other Doom franchise entry, but still. It almost feels odd that Glory Kills weren't introduced until the 2016 reboot. Because they're so ingrained in the series now. It's like the central mechanic of the reboot. It changes the entire strategic makeup of the series. Instead of being a game about avoiding enemies and collecting ammo and health pickups, the Bethesda era forces you into the enemy's face if you want to survive. After doing enough damage, enemies start flashing, and that's when you can get up close and rip them apart with a satisfyingly gory shower of blood. It's not just an easy way to finish enemies off, either. Depending on the color they're flashing, they'll drop health or ammo. That's what makes glory kills so essential. The combat in Dune 2016, and especially Eternal, is fast and really deadly, so having a means to quickly refill health and ammo without having to leave the fight completely alters the way you play the game. It's, it's a much more flashy in-your-face experience that rewards skillful movement and risk taking and while yes it does a lot to redefine the goals of the series also feels correct like nothing about it feels like it doesn't belong in doom and that's why while the old g games are, are obviously great the glory kills really made the franchise into what it is right now <laughs> And not a lot of franchises can say that they have that kind of positive development that far into their life cycle. And number six is styles and style switching in Devil May Cry. The series didn't introduce this till Devil May Cry 3, and, and the crucial ability to switch between them on the fly didn't appear till Devil May Cry 4, but it's a feature that's basically synonymous with the series at this point. As a quick refresher, you can pick between Trickster, Swordmaster, Gunslinger, and so on before starting a mission, and they all had their own dedicated style button. If you press the button with Trickster, for example, you do a dash, useful for escaping enemies, obviously, Swordmaster, extra weapon attack, gun Gunslinger, new shooting abilities, Royal Guard, you have a more powerful, but, uh, you know, more difficult to pull off parry. Each style really altered how you played the game, but without the ability to swap between them freely, it made it difficult to predict which style would be best for each level. In Devil May Cry 4, they let you swap between styles at the press of button, which kind of makes sense, given what Devil May Cry is, and everything about the system just finally clicks there. You can pull out these absolutely absurd combos by switching between styles between attacks, and it adds so much depth to the combat while also making it more acceptable. Pretty much the perfect system for a game like this. Uh, Devil May Cry 5 has it, and it was so good they eventually ported it back to Devil May Cry 3 with the Switch port, making it the definitive version of that game, period. Styles and style switching make the gameplay so much more interesting and complex. It's honestly tough going back to 1 and 2. Uh, 2 is kind of tough to go back to. In general, the game's pretty rough, but even 1, it just feels like something's missing. 
And number five is uh, the grappling hook, the good grappling hook from Just Cause. Nobody remembers the first Just Cause game because it wasn't that good for a lot of reasons, but a big one's the grappling hook. In the first game, it only works on vehicles, and that's stupid. Cool gimmick for hijacking cars, but Just Cause 2 was like, hey, here's a completely new grappling hook mechanic. And that's when the series just really took off. You can use it anywhere, and it's absurdly powerful. You grapple up buildings, open up a parachute, use the grapple to pull yourself through the air, grapple onto the ground to somehow break an otherwise deadly fall i don't know that kind of defies the laws of physics entirely because you would think that grappling would actually bring you to the ground at higher than terminal velocity but whatever it, it's whatever the grapple in the second game does it all it makes no sense how it works don't care it's fun that's what matters and the design of the second game fully understands that. Just being able to use the grapple to parachute around the world makes a huge difference. Instead of being a vehicle-focused open-world game, you can ignore cars if you want to just fly around like a slightly limited Superman. Just Cause 3 introduced the wingsuit, and that made getting around even faster and easier. But I think the superpower grapple is really what changed the franchise the most. At number four, CQC in the Metal Gear franchise, uh, close quarters combat, as it is known, is an integral part of the Metal Gear Solid universe, but wasn't actually introduced until Metal Gear Solid 3. The intense hand-to-hand -hand combat and close-range takedowns are a key part of every game since then. What was that? Some kind of judo? No, it's called CQC, a basic form of close quarters combat. He and I developed it together. Almost every game has some kind of crazy martial arts battle between Snake and somebody using CQC, and those are the most iconic moments in the later games, but MGS 1 and 2 don't even have it. And let's not even start about Metal Gear on the MSX and NES. But in this instance, unless the CQC completely changed the direction of the series, because it really didn't, it's just one more tool among any, but it's such an iconic part of the games. When you go back to MGS 1 and 2, it's just weird that it's not there. Post-MGS 3, everyone just knows CQC, and it's an accepted part of the story. It looks cool, serves a fun gameplay mechanic, and gives you new ways of taking down enemies. It's just a fun ability that lets devs do more interesting things with the wrestling of a guard or watching a ridiculous cutscene of two guys trying to out John Wick another person pretty well versed in cqc i see what the hell are you talking about solid snake you trying to sell me some is this a, is this an mlm thing like a pyramid scheme or something it's close quarters combat i thought you were well versed in it but apparently you don't even know the acronym Yep, that's it. So, uh, did you watch the game last night man? I gotta stop coming around this water cooler. This one's weird and number three is takedowns from the Burnout series. The first two Burnout games are fairly straightforward street racing games, like real Aladdin stuff, stealing bread and whatnot. Uh, no, that's, that's, anyway, the only, the only real gimmick to get back on track is uh, rewarding risky driving with the Nitro Boost to make them stand out. Burnout 3 Takedown was the first to actually reward players for crashing their rivals. Along with the much beloved puzzle game in disguise crash mode, and the series has really been a celebration of an aggressive vehicular mayhem ever since. Nobody cares about the Burnout series pre-takedown, and this is why. Those early games had the speed and the arcade gameplay, but until the third game, it really wasn't unique in any way. It was the first to introduce the takedown mechanic where you're rewarded for crashing rivals. Yeah, you couldn't knock out opponents until the third game, which might not sound like a big thing, but it makes a huge difference. Now, acting as aggressively as possible it's highly rewarded so it's not just about winning it's about taking down your rivals watching another player's car go tumbling through the air it's mega sad like it's so satisfying the third game was the first to introduce crash mode in the series as well it's a mode where you drive a car into traffic and try to cause as much destruction as possible which is one of the best mini games in driving game history and it's still incredibly fun with burnout 3 the series transitions from an arcadey but pretty straightforward racer to this glorious celebration of vehicular destruction and it's so much better for it.
At number two is Manuals in the Tony Hawk Pro Skater series. Hard to believe, but Manuals actually didn't appear until Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2. The first game didn't have Manuals at all, which is crazy to me. It's like if you couldn't jump in a Mario game until Mario 2, which uh, let's not talk about Mario 2. Uh, manuals are skateboarding tricks involving balancing the board on the ground. They're not jump tricks. They're not grind tricks. You do them while just skating around. What makes them so important, though, is these games are all about building gigantic combos. That's what Tony Hawk is completely about. But if you hit a wall or stop during a trick, the combo ends. That's where manuals come in. These things let you keep the combo going between lines. So even if there's nothing between a grind and a half pipe, you can keep the combo alive by doing a manual. It's an essential tool in the series, or basically any skateboarding game. But the first Tony Hawk didn't have them. The funny thing is, there are people who are like purists about the first game and still hate them, thinking that they made combos too easy. Personally, I, I like them. They generally expand the possibilities of the game, which I think is good. Um, it's the stuff about getting on and off a board in Tony Hawk Underground that kind of feels cheesy to me. And finally, at number one, copy abilities in the Kirby series. You know Kirby, right? The pink puffball that can suck up enemies and copy their powers. Uh, that's the character. But it wasn't always the character. In the very first Kirby game, the one for Game Boy, Kirby wasn't even pink. He was white, and he couldn't copy enemy powers. Seriously, the one thing everyone associates these games with was not in the first game. The power didn't come until Kirby's Adventure on the NES. And yes, the NES came after the Game Boy game, which sounds wrong, but keep in mind the NES one didn't come out till 1993, which was two years after the Super Nintendo came out in North America. Like, imagine a Sony first-party game coming out exclusively on the PS4 after the PS5 launched, except for without the backwards compatibility. It sounds nuts, but the 90s were a different time, man. Kirby had most of his other abilities in the original game. He could suck up enemies and float, but the power that really makes these games noteworthy wasn't in the game. Like, it's the thing that makes Kirby Kirby. Kirby without copy abilities is just like a pink ball that can kind of float, which who cares? With copy powers though, you do not mess with Kirby. And I have one quick bonus for you before we depart for the day. Uh, strafing in Ratchet and Clank, another case of an early installment just completely missing the boat. The first Ratchet and Clank, it didn't have the extremely basic but essential ability to strafe. If you wanted to move sideways and avoid enemy fire and shoot at the same time, it was no dice. It made all the shooting so much more awkward, which wasn't bad necessarily. Like the first game had more exploration and puzzle solving, but the lack of strafing makes it the weakest game in a now long running series. Like look at any given part of Rift Apart. It would be miserable to play this game without strafing. You'd be dead in seconds. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is of course a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter, the Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.